Welcome to the teaching ministry of Calvary Chapel Corinth with Senior Pastor Charlie Villard. We're an expositional teaching church with a mission to comfort those in any affliction with the comfort in which we ourselves have been comforted by God. We're glad to have you join us today, so let's open up our Bibles and begin our verse-by-verse study in God's Word. Matthew chapter 7. I was going to say 6, and I'm like, well, that looks awful familiar. Matthew chapter 7. So, um, you know, we're, we're three quarters of the way through the sermon, the book of Matthew. Sheena asked me yesterday, she was doing like a calendar, and she's like, so how long do you think we're like pretty much wrapping up Matthew pretty soon? And I'm like, oh man, we probably aren't going to wrap Matthew until like the end of next year. She's like, what? Oh no, I'm thinking Corinthians. Sorry, I'm not... I'm like, no, we're close on that. I don't know how long Matthew's going to take. I'm like, we got 20 chapters left. I'm like, it'll be like a good, good 20 weeks probably. I, I'd like to do one a week. But I, again, I, I've said it before. I want to stop and chew on things that are necessary. So um, we're about halfway through his sermon, you know, and then we'll start seeing the Lord's miracles and the things that he was doing. But in chapter 7, we're going to touch on the most highly debated topic probably in the Sermon on the Mount, judging. Uh, starting in verse 1, judge not that you not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with, measure, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give give what is holy to dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, as they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. All right, so we're going to go further, but let's, let's step back. So this is probably the most quoted Bible verse by non believers, right? This first verse. Judge not. Not that you be not judged, or don't judge me, because you're not supposed to judge. That's what Jesus said. That's absolutely not what he says here. Right? That's not at all. What he is saying ultimately is before you judge, make sure that you're not a hypocrite. But he does give some qualifications though. So he says, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. Now there's a blessing and a curse in that, right? The, the blessing is that if you show mercy and you show grace in how you deal with people, that that's how God will deal with you. The curse is if you deal harshly with people, that's how God will deal with you. It's, it's clear, right? And, and to me, when I read this, right, it's, it's clear. It's the words of God. Because he says that as you judge... The judgment that you use against others and the measures that you use will get back to you. So, you know, I I, does this say don't judge people? No, not at all. Because how else? He'll go on to talk in a few minutes about fruit. All right. We will know them by their fruit. How else will we actually know people if we don't make judgments to go what they did is bad? What they did is good. Right. It's inherently built into us. Little kids know it. When you say to your kid, why did you hit your brother? Uh, I didn't hit him. Yes, you did. Okay, so first of all, now you're lying and you're hitting. The behavior is built into us because of the fall of man. And the only way for us to be able to correct is to make a judgment call. We have to, right? And that's what we are called to do. Now, I could argue that's not really judging. If you think about a court case... When you go into a court, right, there's a judge, and he's going to discern the facts from the lies, right, the truth from the lies. That's what he's supposed to do. Because each side's going to bring their own story, not their own truth. I, I, that phrase drives me nuts. Well, it's my truth. And it's like, well, no, it's just your perception. It's just all a lie. It's not the whole truth. We don't, we don't like to deal with the whole truth. We like to deal with what sounds good for us. People prefer to believe what they prefer to be true. So you go into this court case, right, and, and each side presents what they believe to be the facts. And the judge has to discern 
hmm, that doesn't seem true, that seems true, because that's backed up by evidence. That is not going to work for the person, but that seems to be true as well, right? And so they have to decide, or a jury has to decide, what do they believe based on the case that's been presented? Each side presents a case that looks best for their argument. The judge is there to find the truth somewhere in between both sides. So his job is to make a judgment call. I believe you did this, the evidence says it. And then he makes a condemnation in a sense, right? Because then he goes, now you have to pay this fine or you have to spend five years in jail paying it off. No, it's not an enviable position. I don't want to do that. But as a parent, that's what you are, right? You're like, look, um, you know, your brother said you did this. You say you didn't. Here's some evidence that you did. I'm going to have to make a judgment call here. You know, we've run into this before. It's something you've been doing. You know, unfortunately, now you're grounded. You know, imagine you're a three-year-old. Be like, don't judge me, man. I'm just trying to be free. I'm just trying to be me. You'd be like, get to your room right now. And I don't want to hear you say that again. That's ridiculous. So the Lord is instructing, which is why, again, I make the argument that I made in the beginning. This is not to the regular people. The Sermon on the Mount was to his disciples. This is how to be as followers, bless you, as followers of me. So, yes, you're going to judge. We need to. We need to discern. That's how you use it. I guess what happens is, and where we start to, um, this starts to sort of break down and people will say, you're so judgmental. And I was thinking about that word and I was like, well, let's, let's break that in half, right? Judge and mental. It's this mentality that you live in and from of just constantly judging. It's a slippery slope because when he's telling this and he says the word hypocrite, the last time he called someone a hypocrite, he was talking to the Pharisees. These law givers, law, not givers, law bringers, right? These lawmen, the Pharisees, their job was to take the arguments of the Jews and sort through them and then make judgments accordingly. The problem, what happened here though is, is that as you, you, as you make a judgment against someone, what is your comparison, right? Where are you making it from? When I do it, I'm coming from a place from the word of God. When I was a non-believer, I came from a place that best suited me, right? That allowed me to do what I wanted, allowed me to continue on what I believe. What I have to realize is that I believed a whole total life full of lies and needed to then know the truth. But what happens is, is you start doing this enough where it becomes like a code, a way of you being more righteous than other people, right? The law doesn't produce righteousness. It's not, that wasn't it, right? The law was to produce guilt. It was to show that you had broken the law. Christ produces the righteousness. So these Pharisees stand there going, yeah, that's wrong, that's wrong, you're wrong for doing that, you're wrong for doing that. They're building themselves up to show, well, I don't do those things, so I'm righteous. Well, they are doing those things. We will clearly see that. And they're, you know, they're not showing any love and mercy and grace in those things, right? They're just, that's it, you're done. I'm going to divorce you, or yeah, go ahead, divorce your wife, she did that. Well, it's like, well, I made a mistake, right? There's no room for those things. So the Lord's not saying, don't judge anyone. It, you have to, right? Th that's part of life. It's the same thing as there's no place in the world for hate. Well, there absolutely is, actually. Because if you love anything, anything you love, whatever opposes that or looks to take that away, you will hate that. It may not be right, you know, and God doesn't want you to live in a world of hate, right? He doesn't want you to be a hateful person. But he hates things. We are made in the image of God. We should hate those things, those same things too. But he doesn't hate people, right? He doesn't. He doesn't hate. He hates sin. He hates the the uh, um, the way the world treats his believers. The way the world treats children. The way the world treats orphans and you know widows. I, there's a lot of things he hates. Divorce. He doesn't want those things that tear people apart being elevated and loved. He, he wants those things to go away. So, you know, in the world, there will be judgment. There, it's necessary. It's a must. But, so now he, he goes in as he continues on in verse 3. 
He says, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own? So he goes, look, okay, if and when you're going to do this, because it's necessary, you must be self-evaluating. You have to look at yourself. And that should change how you approach judgment, right? I, if I'm filled with anger and rage at the wrongdoings of the world, which I am, man, it makes me angry. It makes me so mad to see the way things are. But if I stay stuck in that, as I dole out judgment, right? As I go, that's not right, don't do that. I can become bitter and angry with it rather than going, man, God doesn't want you to do that. It's not really in the word. I mean, it can be in the words, it can be in your tone, but it's the heart, it's the intent. My intent is just to walk around and pass judgment that's being judgmental. It's right. Having this sort of place that you've slipped into of this mentality of constantly just judging and going, well, I don't do that. So I feel righteous. It's, um, I, I imagine I know it. I say, I imagine because I'm leaving room that it's not possible. I know my daughter looks at me and goes, you are the most judgmental person in the entire world. I, I know it. And she's not wrong. She's not wrong. I mean, I, I see good and evil. I see the things that, that are wrong. I saw them before I was a believer. I mean, I, I, I got raised by a, a guy who understood the Bible, right? My dad, he knew, he knew right from wrong and he tried to live right from wrong. But he's, you know, he's a human being. He made mistakes, sinned. That's what happens. But I suppose because of my fear of the world and how it will affect my kid, I can become overly judgmental, right? I can not show enough love or understanding. You know, the, the, the other caveat to that is with, you know, in a situation like we're in, I can find myself going, yeah, but it's not gonna, this is not gonna pan out the way that you think. It's not gonna work the way that you hope this time. It's the same, right? And you, you find yourself stuck in this mental mentality, this mental position. So as the Lord starts to talk about this, what he's saying is you, you got to change how you think about yourself before you do any of that, right? Self-examination. And this is tough, right? People don't want to do it. Um, it's necessary. See where things come from. Do I do this before I go ask them? You know, and I think if we spend more time having... There's a catch-22 to that, right? If you spend too much time thinking about yourself and you stay stuck inside yourself, uh, that's a problem. Because then you go, no, I'm just a piece of crap. I'm never going to do anything and I'm the worst. You know, that's the extreme side of thinking about yourself. The opposite side is never thinking about yourself and just judging people. We, we, we have to strike a balance, right? we got to find that middle ground to go, look, I've been there. I've done these things. God saved me from them. He's healed me. He showed me a better way. That's the place we should come from as we talk to people. I'm not different than you. I haven't got it figured all out, right? I, I'm not, I haven't reached some status of perfection that I now know and I can walk around just down like, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. You know, we, we should be approaching others in love, right? Knowing that God has given us wisdom. He's filled us with his spirit. He said, these things are wrong, these hurt. Others. We talked about it a few Thursday nights ago with the gifts, right? That gift of discernment or the gift of prophecy, right? Or the gift of the word of wisdom that you might give somebody. And they go, wow, how'd you know I do that? And it's like, well, I, I don't. I mean, I, I did. And do still, I still fail. And I figured, you know, hey, you're not much different than me. And it's like, well, I do do that. I think seasoning everything like the salt with the love as you do it shows care. Right? You can't just walk up to somebody and be like, hey, I'm Jim, yep, you're a jerk. Well, how do you even know that? And they're like, well, I can just tell by the way you move. You know, we, we make those snap decisions in our head, like by the way he walked in, by the way he shook my hand, by the way he dresses. I, you know, you, you, you try to size people up. I mean, maybe I'm the only person that does that, but I do. Um, and I gotta go, okay, look, I don't know this person. I have no idea what their life experience is. I don't know what they've gone through. I don't know what's hurting them. Maybe I should just get to know them first. And as I get to know them and as we talk, Right? You get to a certain point where maybe they talk about the same thing over and over again. You're like, yep, starting to see a pattern here. You know, maybe you're stuck in this. 
you know, and it softens the approach, right? Because over time, as we get to know people and have relationships with them, you start to see patterns and you're like, man, I think some God might want to work on in your life. So he says, let's be self-examiners as we come up with these things, because it's worse if you go to someone to help correct them and you do that without any regard, right? That, that same thing. He's talking about this plank. And he, he comes up with this crazy, like, sort of funny example. Imagine, I think about it like a cartoon, right? You got this giant two by four sticking out of your forehead, you know, and, and it's see a speck. What do you have to do? You're like, you're like, I mean, I have to, I'm getting old, right? Or like, what? You know, I noticed I was looking at the Tylenol. She was like, oh, how much Tylenol was in that thing? And I'm like, I'm like, oh man. And if I had a plank in my eye, I'm banging in my hand, it's sticking out, it's moving all around, it's whacking people as I walk around, right? I'm, I'm actually just pouring out grossness and hitting and hurting people. Like you just hit it, you know, the kid in the eye, you know, because you're just swinging your elbow randomly. If, if you're, it's terrible, it's a terrible example, I'm really sorry, but it was, it was so funny because I could just pitch you like, wow, get out of here. Totally not like that, actually. You were. I, I saw him. He like literally just ran straight into your elbow. You know, but if you have a plank sticking out of your forehead, you can't even adjust to look in because you can't look past what's staring you right straight in the face. That's the problem, right? That's what the Lord's getting at. He's like, how, how could you possibly look at a speck? You wouldn't see it. And he's not minimizing sin. Right? I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that he's doing that here because what people will come away going is, well, it's no big deal in their life. No, 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 it's a big deal because you wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't a big deal. What he's saying is, is that being a hypocrite is far worse than pointing out someone's sin in their life. Right? That's, that's his point. He says, how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye. It's funny as you read things, you see, I, I see the stupidest stuff on the internet and it just reminded me of something that I saw this, this, uh, I don't know, it's like an eyelash, eyelash suction cup or something. It's supposed to like rip onto your lid or puff your, I, I don't really even know what it is, honestly. It's just this long stick with a suction cup. And I saw this video and the girl got it stuck on her eye and instead of like on her eyelid, it stuck on her eyeball. When she pulled it, her eye moved out. And I, it's, it's like, watch dumb. I really seriously, like I'm laying in bed going, oh, I wonder how many good fail videos there are. And I look through like the best fails for 2023. And it's, I see this. So I, you know, you're going in very intimately to somebody's face when you go to pull out something, right? I mean, most people are like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you doing that? I remember Sheena wanted to you try contacts and my mother was going to try to put it in her eye. And it's like, I look, Cause she's like, I can't do it myself. Can you help me? And it's like my mom and my mom's friend down on the floor. They're holding her hands down. My mom's trying to go in, put the contact in. And she's screaming. She's like, no, no, no. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big deal, right? You're going into an intimate. And not a, intimacy is not a sexual thing, right? It's, it's closeness. You know, fellowship you have with brothers and sisters, right? You say things to them. That's intimacy. It's, men have a hard time with that. I do. But when you go into their eye, you, they're exposing themselves to you. They're trusting you that when you go in and whatever you pull out is going to make their life better. The problem is godly things, they, they go right to the heart, right? And so what you try to pull away is a scab on a problem that's far deeper probably than just, yeah, you probably shouldn't call her name. Right, right. You're really you're you're starting to dig and uncover things. So the Lord says it's important. You can't just walk up and be like, "Oh, hey, dude, let me grab that and pull it out of your eye." Also makes me think of like imagine like a guy coming up like, "Oh, you got an eyelash on your face." I see ladies do it. Like, "Oh, you got an eyelash," you know, and they'll nicely and so softly pull the eyelash off someone's face. But like a guy coming in, like, "You got an eyelash," and be like, "Dude, get back! What are you doing? You can't! Don't touch me! It's weird, man." <clears throat> He's like, look, I'm just trying to help you. Right? you, you the person, are they going to see it as help? 
they will definitely not see it as help if they've watched you do it as a hypocrite. So he says, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck. He does not say, walk away, don't judge them, dude. It's not how he ends it. He gives the instruction on how we are to judge. So you'll hear it, right? They'll quote, oh, they might even know the passage, Matthew 7, 1, don't judge me. Um, yep, but there's 20 verses after that that you should read. And the whole thing about like pulling out a verse, and, and you know, we can do it, right? As, as brothers and sisters, I might pull up a verse and it might mean something, and it's not the whole total context. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the, speaking of eyes, they say you should have 20 20 vision in the Bible. So if you're going to go in and you're going to pull a verse out, read the 20 before it and the 20 after it. Because to use it properly and in context, make sure you understand it. The world's just going, no, you're, you're already a hypocrite because your savior said, don't judge. You're like, no, that's actually not what he said. So in six, he goes on now here at the end of it, he says, be careful with your judgment. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Godly wisdom is like a pearl, right? This, this nugget of sand that ends up in the gut of a clam, you know, or whatever. And it just gets churned over and over and over again until it finally becomes this, this perfect, round, beautiful thing, right? And a, it's, it's sought after today. People buy these expensive pearls and wear them as jewelry. It's... God's wisdom is a pearl. God's correction is a pearl. It's, it's precious. When you're going to do it, think about, are they going to receive this? Are they really, are they truly going to receive this? Again, we're kind of evaluating, right? Going, they are not going to take that wisdom. They're going to turn that right back around. Well, then maybe it's best that you don't give that to them. And God, the Holy Spirit, man, he's following everybody around, telling them people when they're wrong. They know it. It's the voice that they've been searing their conscience to ignore. So he says, don't, don't give those things, right? Dogs, oh, I love my dogs. I mean, you guys know it. I've got this dog going through heartworm treatment. He eats his own throw up. It's nasty. And he goes outside when it stuff freezes up and he eats frozen poop. Obstacles. Like, really, this dog is just one of the smartest dogs we've owned. And so stupid at the same time. But, like, he, he can figure out how to, he rings a bell to go outside. You know, he knows when, he, when he's hungry to go over and tap his food container or go over and stand near it. I mean, you, you say things in human form and he'll look at you and go, oh, okay. Go, gets, goes, gets a toy, brings it over. But he eats his own poop and throw up. Like, really, like, how smart can you be to do those things? He doesn't think about that. He does what a dog does. That's what dogs do. That's, that's, he's like, I'm just being a dog. And I'm going, can you not be a dog? I, he was just barking earlier when I walked over. And Lexi's like, oh, poor dogs. And my daughter, poor dog, that. He just needs to be quiet. He's, they're so spoiled, it's crazy. He doesn't need to bark at people when they walk by. But he's doing what a dog does. That's what they do. Pigs the same way. Wash a pig off and clean it. It goes right back into the muck and covers itself up. And you're going, look, can you, can you not be a pig? I just cleaned you. And you're trying to, we try to rationalize with them. And they're like, no, it's just in me to do that. It's a terrible example, but that's the way heathen, right? Unbelievers is the King James. I like heathen sounds cooler, right? That's the heathens. They're dogs. They're pigs. They don't know what they're doing. They're doing what heathen do. To correct and um, try to, you know, help others, we have to tell them things at times that they're not going to want to hear. But we also don't want to waste those nuggets, right? Those pearls. We want to be careful with them. So he says, be careful with them because otherwise they will turn that back around on you and tear you to pieces. Sometimes that will happen and God will have called you to say it. Right? You got, you got to be in prayer. God, fill me with your spirit. Do you want me to say this? I want to. But do you want me to? 
So he continues on in seven. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you? If his son asks for bread, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. This is the law and the prophets. So, just as we were talking about, right? Ask God for wisdom. Should I speak to them? Ask God for all things. He goes on and he says, ask. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open for you. We have this progression, right? Just ask him. Then the next part, if you don't have an answer, would be to what? Seek him. Which is sometimes where we pray and fasting, right? That's seeking the Lord. Using that, you know, uh, continuing and steadfastly in prayer. Maybe you ask in a prayer and you're like, oh, hey, Lord, maybe you'll do this. Okay, thanks. You know, probably won't, but all right. You know, you're setting yourself up because it's going to be disappointing when God doesn't come through. I do it to God all the time. It's sinful. It's terrible. I'm like, look, I know you're probably not going to do this, but you said ask, so I'll, I'll ask it. Can you make it so my basement doesn't leak? Oh, there's some water. Figured you weren't going to do that one, right? The next step would be to seek the Lord. You know, you hear people say that all the time. Well, I'm seeking the Lord on a relationship, or I'm seeking the Lord on a job change, or if I should move. Cool. What are, you, what are you doing? I mean, are you standing around waiting? Are you taking action? You know, prayer and fasting reminds me of the, the demons that wouldn't come out of the people. The disciples went back to the Lord and were like, hey, this is not working. And he goes, oh, yeah, these kind. These only come out with prayer and fasting. What he's saying is, is it's not just a matter of saying the word, right? Not, I don't mean like get out. What I mean God's word. He's like, this one's going to be different. You're going to have to use the word. But you're going to be praying diligently and fasting for these kinds. These are different. Our kids, that's a good thing to pray and fast for. And I've done that over the years. Still, I go, thanks, Lord. That was a waste. Now I'm just, now I'm just starving. And now I'm irritated because it didn't come through the way I had hoped. So he goes to the next level. Knock, and it shall be opened. Right? So he says, ask the Lord, then seek the Lord. Then go knocking on doors. Not like the, you know, the Mormons, but like knocking on God's door, right? Maybe, maybe testing out some things, right? Walking through a door. Like, look, I don't know if I, I God, do you want me to, what do you want me to do? Lord, I want to plant a church. Uh, where do you want me to go? And then the Lord goes, um, I, yeah, go ahead, you know, try it out. Or he doesn't answer. And I go, okay, well, I'm going to fast. And I'm like, get an answer. And he's like, yeah, go do this. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to, just go and see what happens. I'm going to make some calls. I'm going to talk to some people. I'm going to have conversations and see what the Lord does with it, right? So I'm taking action now. Asking doesn't do anything. We can just lay in bed and ask. Seeking requires a bit more care and attention. Got to open up the word. Got to read through the scripture. See if he speaks to you. Pray. Do some fasting. Then if all else fails, go take action and see what the Lord does. Pastor Chuck talks about it, the distinctives. Um, he's talked about it all the time, right? You go... And you say, Lord, either you're in this or you're not in this. I'm going to go do that. And if you're not in it, let me know. And I'll just go home and do something else. If you're in it, then I'm going to keep moving forward. So he says, do these things. He says, for everyone who asks, receives. What does, it, what is, he, what is he not saying here? He's not saying you're going to get everything you ask for. Because the idea behind the asking and the prayer is that we would fall into line with God's will. Not that God would do our will while we're praying. Is that as we pray, we get closeness to God, and, we, and God then goes, here's my heart. And you go, oh, yeah, I want to have your heart for that. I want to be in line with what you have. Many or most or all of us at some point, we go to prayer hoping God's going to answer for what we want. And what we should be praying for is what God's will is. As we, as we looked in the model prayer back in last week, or two weeks ago, you know, that's, that was the idea behind it, is the model wasn't, hey, God, give me everything I want, right? It was, let me know your will. I, wanted, I want to seek your will. I want your will on earth as it is in heaven. 
And he says that if you ask that, you'll receive. God will give you his heart. He'll give you the picture, his will. He will align you with those if you're open to allowing that. And then he says, he who seeks will find. If you seek the Lord, you will find him. You get the person that's like not opposed to church. They but yeah, I'm seeking the Lord. I've been seeking the Lord for 42 years. Like, trust me, he's not that hard to find. Maybe you're not seeking in the way you should seek. And then he says, to him who knocks, it will be opened. Man, person asking for the Lord, seeking him, where, seeing where he's at, going around and, and, and trying things. I mean, there's nothing wrong with finding a church. Church hopping is difficult, right? Because you're looking for something and really what you need to look for is the word and you need to settle into that. Um, but, you know, there are things about church you want, right? If you go to a church and you're 20 years old and everyone is 80, it's, you know, the fellowship gonna be probably difficult. I actually would prefer that, honestly. I like to glean wisdom from people far older than me or more experienced than me. Because the people my age still don't know what they're doing. And it's like, well, you're not really a help. I need to know how to like live my life. First church we went to was a, was a, a real older crowd. And it was great. But it's, it's hard to find equal fellowship, you know, and, and people in the same stage of life. So, you know, as you go around and as you do that, I, I have respect for a person looking to find where God calls them to. But if you're hopping 10 years down the road, maybe you're just, maybe you're seeking the wrong thing. So as we do that, he says, I'll be there for you. It's okay. He says, or what man is there among you? If his son asks for bread, we will give him a stone. It's a pretty clear example, right? Like, do you hate your kid? No, you don't. So you're going to give him bread if he's hungry, not a rock and go here just chew on that. Or if he asks for a fish, you will give him a serpent. If you then, being evil, I always love it how he says that. If you then, being evil, he's not really calling you and me as Christians evil people. He's going, look, in comparison and in light to God, we are evil. If you're that good being this lowly, how, how is the Lord not any better? How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? have to think about what we're asking for. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. What's this called? The golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Oddly enough, not actually spoken for the first time by the Lord. The world will tell you that. They'll be like, he wasn't the first one to come up with the golden rule. No, no, he was not. But it doesn't change it. It doesn't, doesn't matter if he was the first one to say it or not. Isn't it the truth? You know, it, in that, you know, he swings back even, I think, into a way, right, and to wrap up this subject on judgment. What would you want someone to do for you or to you if they're in the position where they need to correct you? I'd want them to not tell the entire church. I'd want them to come to me have a conversation with me I hopefully would be open I might not be you know you, if you think about those things that will help change the approach you have with others you know uh, it, it, and it can apply the golden rule right it's called that because it can apply to everything how you treat people in the store how you treat people on the phone how you treat your brother and sister how you treat your wife or your kids it doesn't really matter and he says therefore Whatever you want men to do to you. The hardest part with this one is it doesn't say whatever you want them to do to you is how they'll do it. Because the fact is, is it's not going to be the case. It can happen in your own marriage. I know Sheena will say it. I can say it. You know, like, that's not how I would have done it for you. But okay. You know, I mean, sometimes she's just blatant when she says things. I'm like, Man, you could have ran that through a filter. It would have felt a little. I mean, I, it's not not un, it's, it's not untrue. It's it's true, but now it's just a little hurtful in the way that it came up. You know, it makes me go, oh, how would I want? How would I have wanted that to be said? And how will I do that to others? You know, and that's that comes back to that self evaluation thing. It's really he said this is the law and the prophets. 
says 13, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. There's one, and let me just be totally clear. One way to heaven. Only one way. It's a narrow way. It's a hard way. It's easy, actually, but it's hard. That's where it gets a little complicated, right? It's easy to understand. No other God, lowercase g God, no other prophet, no one apart from here says there's one way to heaven, right? Because they were all men. They were just, just people. We're not talking about, we don't serve him. We serve God. He wasn't just a man. He was fully God and fully man. He was a God man. He wasn't just a, just a person. He was the person. And he says himself here, enter by the narrow gate. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. He's saying, take the hard way. The hard way is worth it. Because though it's easy to understand that Christ came, he is the son of God. He called himself that. He said those things. He's like, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to prepare a place for you. My father's house. Right? I'm going to come back again. He said all these things. There's no denying it. What he also said was, is oh, here there's, there's always there's going to be all kinds of different ways that people are going to say it. There's just only one. Because the broad way leads to destruction. He doesn't have to break it down any further than that because it should be enough for us to go, look, I don't want to go the way that leads to destruction. <laughs> there's a... Um, Uh, oh, never mind. Duh, it's recording the video. There's this cool C.S. Lewis, uh, Lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe. Anybody, like, read the book? Mm -hmm. The book quote, and I, I usually post it, like, once a year, and it tells this story, and I can't even remember the girl's name. Maybe it's Jill. I, I don't know. But the point in it is awesome, right? This girl, she sees, she's thirsty, right? And she goes to this stream, and she wants to drink of it. And Aslan, the lion, who's God, right? He's like, you, you can't, you can't, you can't drink of it. I'm gonna butcher this. But he says, to, to do that, you've got to gotta come closer to me, right? You gotta come to me. And she's like, uh, maybe there's like another stream that I could somewhere else I could go. Cause you know, you look big and scary. And he's like, no, there's no other stream. And, She's like, um, I don't know. I mean, he's like, look, if you don't, if you don't take a drink, you're just going to die. And she's like, well, if I come to you for the drink, will you promise that you won't devour me up? And he's like, no, I won't promise that at all. And she's like, ah, oh, geez. Then I probably just got to go somewhere else to look. And he's like, there is nowhere else. You'll just die. Right. And go read the quote. It's way better because C.S. Lewis is a genius and I butchered it. But the, the point, do you get the point? right? There is only one way. We can go try and look at all the other ways, but the Lord himself said it's one way. Anything else other than this is destruction, and people will still not want to believe it. They'll be like, well, maybe I should go find out for myself. And the Lord's loving. He'll go, okay, you can if you want. I mean, that's what you, that's what you do, but at least the destruction, he said, there are many who go in by it. God's will in the Bible is that all men would come to know, right? Every man and woman and child would come to know who Christ is, how good God is in saving grace and have eternal life. The fact is he knows that it won't be the case because he says there are many who go and buy him. 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to what? Life. And there are few who will find it. Man, I, I get this passage now. I was, in, I was dead I was just a dead person walking around for 30 years. Not a clue what was going on. Not like I didn't see. I told you, I, I, I know right from wrong. I knew good from evil. I was taught it at a young age. I looked around and went, man, this world is just full of evil. It's an evil place. Being created from a monkey didn't even make sense to me. It didn't even in school. I'd be like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You know, it has to be something greater in this life that just happenstance but I could also see there was evil in the world and there seemed to be no answer for it how does evil go unchecked 
who who punishes evil? The government's supposed to, right? The government's only around for a couple of things. Not to dish out welfare, not to just to tell you what you should believe and should not, not to tell you whether marriage is, you know, between a man and a woman or anyone. That's not what the government's for. The government's for is to maintaining order in the nation and punishing <clears throat> evil. That's it. Those are the two reasons that the forefathers, founding fathers of this nation set up the government. Marriage is a foundation of the church. It's not a foundation of the government. And the Constitution says that the government should stay out of the church. It doesn't say that the church should stay out of government. It says that the government should stay out of the church. It doesn't have business there because it doesn't know the things of God. People want to get married, men, two men want to get married, they could do whatever, call it something else though. Because marriage is the foundation of the Lord, it's the foundation of the church. So what happens is all these things get all screwy, right? The, the government's going to save me. Now the government's not going to save you. The people here, they're going to cheer, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. They were being waiting to be saved from the government of this time. It's, today is not any different. You serve a tyrannical government. They can just do things. I mean, I don't want to get political, but you see the news about Trump being pulled from the, the ballot? I don't really like Trump. I'll make it clear. I think he's mouthy and a disgusting person. Is he better than someone else? <laughs> Sadly, probably. Do I care if he's on the ballot? No. What I care about, actually, is someone not doing something that they're not supposed to. If it's the government of the people, I should decide if he's on there or not by my vote. Someone shouldn't take away something. And that's what people think about as they think about us as Christians. When I look at the government, they think about us as the, like, like we look at the government. You're just judging people. You're telling me what I can and can't do. You can't do those things. Difference is, is, we don't serve a group of people. We serve God. And we, we live by his word. But I understand it when I think about it. That's what they see. I'm holding them back from something they desperately want, even though it will lead them to destruction. Does that make sense? That was a weird way around that whole thing. But, right? That's, that's how they see us. We look at it and go, you can't tell me I can't meet in church. I answer to God. And they go, yes, we can. And legally, we can tell you what we're going to do. We saw how that worked out for us in Warrington. We did what we wanted to do. We did what God called us to do, actually, not what we wanted. Because of things like this, because we know what the end looks like, because God has told us that if we take the narrow way, the difficult way, it will lead to life. That's what the whole point of the Constitution was, right? The, the three tenets, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People are free to pursue whatever they want to be happy, even if we don't agree, even if they're totally, totally wrong. But we are free to judge them as long as we're a good self-evaluator and go, this is not going to end the way you'd hope. And I can't give you hope, can't tell you something nice and frilly that's going to make you feel better. It's going to end in destruction. That guy beat his last four wives. He's going to beat you. He's not different. I'm sorry. Is he a Christian? No, he hates church. He's not different. He will beat you too. A drug addict. He's going to go get high again. Unless God has cured him. But even in that, it still happens. Right? It, that was probably a bad example. Um, because it does, right? I mean, we still fall. We're still human beings. But you can tell them, like, look, dude, you're going to go do this. It is going to lead to destruction. This is not going to lead to life. You're going to waste it, and you'll probably lose it. And you tell them because you love them, it's urgent. And they're going to go do it anyway. You go back to this and be like, look, narrow is the gate. It's the, it's the, it's the skinny way, right? It's like squeezing through. It's going to take off all the gross world. Take off my gut, right? And I said, I squeeze through into heaven. What's hopefully going to happen. But it's, it's, it shakes off all the rest of the world, takes it all off of you as you pass through. People don't want a hard life. Then you don't really want to be a Christian because it's not an easy life.
but it will be in heaven. For now, we have a whole world to battle. He says in 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. There we go, right? So how are you going to not be judgy and know when a wolf walks in in sheep's clothing ready to attack the flock? So when I'm dealing with you one-on-one, -on -one, right? I'm your pastor, whether I love it or not. I mean, I love, I love you guys. The, the role is little now. But eventually I might have to come and have a conversation with you. Do you think I'm going to love that? Probably not, right? But I love you, so I'm not going to not have it because I don't want you to fall into these things. But as the, your pastor, if someone new walks in and they want to go hang out with the kids, do you want me to be judgy? Yeah, because I'm supposed to protect your kids. So when someone walks in and I'm sizing them up or Frank sizing them up at the door or looking at them, we're looking going, are they carrying? Who are they? Are they weird? Have a conversation. I mean, this stuff goes on all the time at big giant churches, right? In Orange, you somebody new comes in all the time. There's always somebody watching. Like, hmm, what are they doing? Why are they sitting way up in the front? It's weird. They're up near the stairs. They could go onto the stage. Someone, hey, maybe go say hi, introduce yourself. Right? There's strategies behind those things. You would want me to be a judgy person. Even maybe overly cautious when it comes to kids. I mean, I should err on the side of grace because that's what I would want, right? I'm not a guy with a faux hawk who walked into church and I don't want people going, man, look at that guy. He is, a, he is never going to get saved. Well, like I walked into a church, I mean, there's a good chance now if you're preaching the gospel that I might be changed by it. But we want that. And he says... You'll know them by their fruits. Supplies both ways. You could have rotten fruit and good fruit. A tree that produces rotten fruit. How do you know a crab apple tree? It's, it's like, I mean, apple trees are kind of ugly anyway. Poor trees. You know, they got to get judged because of their ugly. look. But crab apples, like kind of small. So sour. Yeah, they're disgusting. It's like rotten fruit. It's never going to be good fruit. We just, we had one and we cut the tree down because it's annoying. Even the deer don't want to eat it. And I'm mowing them over and they're shooting across the yard and getting chopped up in the mower. I mean, I tried one and it was horrendous. Oh, you're supposed to like keep a straight face and be the coolest of your cousins. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. See, when we were kids, we threw them at each other and you got welts because oh, yeah. they don't like soften at all. No, no. it's good to be tough, right? Be tough. Eat that. Oh, it's a good, this is a good tree. It's good fruit. I burn that thing down, it is done. You will know them by their fruits. Even so, every, oh, sorry, he says, uh, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes and figs from thistles? No. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. We will have to judge in order to know which fruit a person produces. And I would definitely do it to a new person walking in that I don't know. And especially if they start asking weird questions like, oh, you have kids, church? You need any volunteers? Nope. Nope, if I have to have somebody else read the word, I'll go volunteer. Not no person's gonna walk in and that's new and gonna volunteer with the kids. Those are our precious pearls. They are. Even if they're rotten sometimes. And that's what they are though. Right? So you, you know, and and it we've gotten to know each other. It's, it's been a little different. We're a church plant and um, but you know, somebody else walking in, they should be here six months, attending regularly, getting to know us all. Uh, get a background and do all the things. That's stuff we should do to make sure before you have access to something, you have produced good fruit. Only way you can do it is judge. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. You know what? Tomatoes are fruit, right? So I actually learned something the other day. The fruit, the difference between fruit and vegetables is fruit comes from flowers where the vegetable is every other part of the plant. So it's like the root, the leaves, the stem, that's what qualifies vegetable and fruit comes from the flower. Interesting. It's yeah. so like eating cucumbers. So right, because they grow off the flower rather than growing off of the root of the... So carrots, our vegetables, lettuce, stuff like that, 
fruits. Okay, this is wrong then, because carrots are not good fruit. That is, no, there's no way that's a good fruit. <laughs> no, that's but how do you give their kids? Like, do you tell your kids like that's fruit? Eat that. Or do they like still a veggie? I mean, they're the ones arguing with us because we're like, whatever, it's vegetable, it's fruit, just eat it. <laughs> I always thought it was the seeds thing, which is why tomatoes and cucumbers were the same. That's good. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, we had a conversation about it the other day. I mean, you guys are you're the experts. I'm not even going to argue that one. That's well, genius. I didn't know that until like last week. We Googled it. And that's what Maybe you're not the experts if you didn't know the whole time. <laughs> Should I trust you? Experts. <laughs> that's right. But how do you do that, right? You're like, by working it and by pulling it out and trying it, by studying it. You had to make judgment calls at some point and go, not a fruit we're going to grow or not a vegetable we're going to grow because it isn't going to sell. Right. We're judgy people. Yeah. This, this church is full of just judgy people. I love it. It says every tree that does not bear good fruit is what? Cut down. I mean, eventually you guys are going to grow things and something grows up in between. And you're going to go, take that out because that's going to ruin what we're trying to do. Such is the church. It says that they be cut down and thrown into the fire. Again, God's will is that all men would come to know. God does not make people <clears throat> evil, does not make people sinful just to throw them into a fire. What would be the point? That it's futile. There's no freedom in that. There's not even, there's not even free will in that. If God, I just made you evil. So you have no free will. But his whole word would be a lie. So I was born like that. It's just a lie. Well, I was, I, was, I was born this way. No, you were not. I mean, born sinful, yes. But that's not, you're like, well, God must have. He made me this way. Nope. Actually, as a matter of fact, scientifically, we were talking about this at one point. I might have mentioned it already. But there's chemicals in your body that make you forget the first few years of your childhood. Because you're a baby. You don't remember all those memories, right? It, it's a scientific thing that you would move on from it. Because being a baby is probably pretty dramatic, actually. You know, I mean, you pull out of the womb, you breathe air, you're going through all these things. You're, you're emotionally a baby is connecting to the mom and the dad. And when it cries because it's hungry, it expects someone to come. And if they don't, then it learns to try to figure out how to survive on its own or not survive. You didn't know you were gay when you were born. It's because you were not. You knew you were sinful. I did not know I was a boy instead of a girl when I was born because I don't remember those things. People say that because it's what sounds good. It's not. It's not the case. We don't. God has made us to bear good fruit, and he wants us to. And until we live in the spirit and we've been saved by God, we really bear rotten fruit. It doesn't even mean there's not some really great people doing great things to the world. But in the end, the total... It's a total loss, ultimately. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. And he says in 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's a disappointment. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day. What day is he talking about? Day of judgment, right? When we stand before him and we go, Lord, Lord, I, I, I believed and trusted on your name. He's going to say to people, I don't know you. Think about someone like Ted Bundy, right? You sociopath, used, manipulated, murdered women for his own pleasure. And he sits in prison. He's going to go to the, the chair. I can't remember what the chair is on. He's going to be killed. James Dobson sits and has conversations with him. Says he comes to Christ. He gets saved. And this whole interview, I, I play that at a class I do, right? Because it ultimately talks about the beginnings of all the things that happened. He grew up in a good Christian home. His parents were good people. He got introduced to pornography really early. Warped his brain all true became violent then he couldn't control it and he's saying i get it i deserve to die i did these things but i'm not the worst of them there's all kinds of things happening right now out in the world that people need to be afraid of when it comes to pornography and its use and what it does to the brain and he said it's going to be far worse in the future if someone doesn't get control over it 
This was like in the 80s. How far worse are we now? 30 some years later, four years later. That guy goes to heaven if he gets saved, right? If he truly gets saved, a guy like that gets to go to heaven. Like the thief on the cross. The one thief that mocked and, you know, the Lord, and then the one hanging on the other cross said, man, you shouldn't be here. You're not like us. If you go to heaven, just save me a place. He's like, you'll be with me in paradise. We won't even be able to judge that dude's fruit. Did he really become a Christian or not? And the Lord told him that. <laughs> so you get these people that you don't mean, don't you and me don't think should be in heaven. Should get punished for the things that he did, not rewarded. You know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. What about someone like Mother Teresa? Catholic church goer? What if she believed in the Catholic church and didn't really believe in truly, truly in Christ and did all that good her entire life and doesn't go to heaven? Is that possible? It is. He says it right here. People will call me Lord, Lord. They'll say my name. And Lord, Lord is a respect, right? Yahweh, Yahweh. And he'll go, I don't know you. To me, that means we must be real careful as Christians to be abiding in Christ and really truly know him and to help others really truly diligently know him and seek him. I don't know if Mother Teresa will be in heaven. I don't know if Ted Bundy will be in hell. When we get there, we'll know. I would hope the world would say, yeah, but she did so much good. Of course she would go to heaven. It's not based on good. He doesn't say that here. It's based on knowing the Lord and not just saying his name, knowing him. In that day, Lord, Lord, we have, not have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Forgive me for railing on the Catholic Church, but do they do all three of those? There are people in the church saved and believers. I have no doubt I have met them. And they just do what they know. But when you elevate man's tradition over church and church doctrine over the Bible, to me, you're in territory that is non believing. You do all these things. And he says, And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It just doesn't apply to people that are just bad. Right? We just see that are sitting in a prison, right? Because the hard, most hardened criminal of all time could go to heaven. So when he gives us now instruction on what to do, all given all that he's just said, he says, therefore, therefore, whoever, whoever, not just people in the Catholic Church or just people in the non-denominational church or people in the Mormon church or non-believers, who. Ever. When God says whoever, he means anyone. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who has built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. So blessing and a curse, right again? If you hear my sayings, and you do these things, be, be Christians, believe on me, abide in me, trust in me. It'll be like you built your house on a rock and anything that comes at it will. Well, he says when he's building his church, what? That the gates of hell won't even prevail against it. If we do those things. But then there's, then there's the, the curse if we do not. God's always really good and clear about giving us the decision we have to make and the consequences for making it or not making it. Consequences are just what, what the fallout is, right? Neither good nor bad. They can be good. They can be bad. He says, but in 26, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell. 
I didn't just fall. What did he say at the end here? And great was its fall. Ever watch a person fall from grace? Man, it is, it is terrible. It's worse. It's worse than a person, I mean, for me, it's worse than a person coming to church and leaving and never making a decision. Because right? that was up to God. Right? They just go and they go off about their way. They go to church once a year, never change their lives. But you see somebody that's been diligently doing something. I've seen this many times. Recently. And then fall. It's been great. Man, when God says great, how, how big of a fall that must be. He doesn't mean great in a good way. And so it was, back, back to Matthew writing now, if your book is not outlined in red. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as having one, as taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Can you imagine sitting around, finishing this teaching and being astonished? To me, like, how could you not go, this man's God? And disciples will, right? Some of the disciples will go in, that's God. There's no way. It's not a scribe, it's not a Pharisee, it's not just reading scripture. He took everything and broke it down and made the extenuating circumstances even worse. He didn't take away the law. You couldn't walk away from this and not be changed. I'm sure there were people, though, right? This is where the hatred began from the Pharisees. And they go, this guy's going to be a problem. Makes me think of a conversation I had with friends. This guy's going to be a problem. He's going to go on to start doing miracles, and his public ministry is really going to begin. That'll be, I mean, it for today. But You know, it... It's hard sometimes to reconcile I don't I've been going to church for well, I'm saved I guess really for 2009 15 years I don't even know I'm so bad at math Sometimes I think I've come so far away from understanding what it was like to not believe. That I'm like, how could you not? I don't understand. It's like, it's a pretty simple truth, right? But then I've heard people quote it to me over my lifetime and go, that doesn't mean anything to me, whatever. We are practical people. We should be, right? We should, we do things, we do good works, we care about others, we do those. We should always really be clear on the name we come to do those in, right? I, and I come in the name of Christ. I come in the name of my church. I mean, it's really, my church represents Christ. You know, people, they hear church and they hear this, they have a judgment, right? For people that aren't supposed to be judgy. Right? You get the most judgment from the people that say, don't judge me. You know, you say, oh, I go to church. I, I, I say it all the time. We were having that funny conversation about like, oh, well, I'm from this church, I'm from this church. I do, I, I literally work it into every conversation I can because I never know if that person might be in the area and I go, hey, come on out and see us sometime. You know, here we are, we meet, right? And, and, and you know, and I, I tend to, I don't go, we're going to read the word of God and we're going to explain it and we're going to talk about it. I tend to go, yeah, we, we hang out on Thursday nights and we eat dinner. I'm like trying to get them to like, well, that sounds like a different church. That's weird. You don't, we don't, I don't see that normally, right? Hoping that I can just like lure them in here with the food and then, you know, we'll read the Bible and God will do something with that. And it really should just be very clear. Like, man, we are Bible believing Christians. We open up the Bible and reread it and we attempt to live like it and we follow it. And that's what we do, you know, because that's not appealing to them. Thank you for joining us today. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. If you have any questions or would like to request prayer, you can visit us online at www.ccorinth.org. If you're local, come join us for a service at 125 School Road in Charleston, Maine. We want to remind you that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Remain armored up, and until next time, grace and peace.